Okay, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Foslock Environmental Technologies 2021 Business Review and Strategic Outlook webinar. My name is Greg Slade and I'm Investor Relations Consultant to Foslock. Shortly, I'll hand over to Cham Chairman David Krasnostein, CEO Lachlan McKinnon and CFO Matthew Parker to take you through today's presentation. At the conclusion of the presentation, I'll return and ask a series of questions we receive from shareholders as part of the registration process for this webinar. We have approximately 200 people on this webinar and a lot of questions were submitted beforehand. I've selected the most regularly asked questions to put to PET management today. The rest assured if we don't get to your particular question, we will respond to you offline from this webinar over the next few days. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to the chairman, Mr. David Krasnostein. Thanks, Greg, uh, and welcome to all our shareholders who have joined us today. We appreciate the interest, uh, and we hope this will be a productive session for you. I'm going to make a few introductory remarks, um, and then I'm going to hand over to our CEO, Lucky McKinnon and our CFO, Matt Parker, for a more in-depth discussion of the state of the company. Many of you, I think, will have read my letter to shareholders in our annual report, so I'm not planning on covering the same ground this morning. As we know, 2021 was an extraordinary year for the company and its management. Much of their time, their energy and their focus was spent in cleaning up the company's affairs and getting them on a solid basis for the future. That effort was time consuming, it was expensive, and it was emotionally difficult for everybody. While our internal investigations are largely now completed, uh, we continue to cooperate with relevant authority, authorities to ensure we can put to rest a number of those legacy matters and to make sure they're comfortable, we fully address them. Where possible, legal proceedings are going to be pursued in an effort to recover the funds and the response, bring responsible people to account. There'll still be some ongoing costs and management time associated with those endeavours. But as 2021 drew to a close, it was very clear to me that this company had pivoted in a new direction. The energy in the company, the conversations around sales, customers, uh, was in marked contrast to what I was witnessing in the year before. Lockie's going to talk to us as an example of that, about his two recent trips overseas. This is the first time in over two years he's been able to get out of Australia and go visit our customers and staff in Europe and in the United States. And I've seen as he returns from those trips, a new energy and a new optimism about pursuing new opportunities and a new energy in our staff as that leadership points them in a forward direction. The whole company, I think I can safely say, is now infused with a more optimistic view of the future. Our management team used 2021 to have a more focused view of our research and development activities, a more focused and a better resourced sales and marketing strategy, and a sharper strategy for redirecting our manufacturing capacity, and also developing a deeper bench strength for our management team worldwide, which is now in place. As we all know, what makes a successful company are its financial resources, its management, its factories, its patents, its human resources, its brand, its growth potential, and most of all, its ability to generate earnings and cash flow. Foslock possesses all those assets. We've set our focus now for 2022 on bringing all of that together to produce tangible results for shareholders. 
We've made enormous efforts to get the company's shares relisted on the ASX. We've done everything we can to meet all the ASX's stated requirements that they've shared with us. And the matter now resides with their staff who are in constant contact with to ensure that they're comfortable, we've met all their requirements and get us back into trading. And we're hoping to hear more from them shortly. Let me now hand over to our CEO to take us through a review of 2021 and what's installed for 2022. And we'll be happy to take questions from shareholders after that. Lucky, over to you. Thank, thank you, David, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to you all, wherever you're listening. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you'll find the next uh, little while informative and productive. We have uh, quite, a uh, quite a list to get through here. Um, I'll just run you through the, uh, the broad topics. I won't go through the detail here on this slide, but we wanted to start with uh, Matt running through some of the financials and, uh, and some of the impacts that, that drove those financials. And then we'll, I'll come back and conduct a, a fairly thorough review through of 2021. Uh, and, uh, and the various topics there are listed, which you'll see, which include, as, as, you'll, uh, as you see, read there, the ASX relisting question, which I'll, I'll try and cover. And, uh, and then I'll finish with some outlook uh, slides and commentary on, on the future of the business, which, uh, as David said, having just done some um, trips uh, around the world, I'm, uh, I'm enthused and very confident about where we're, where we're heading. So uh, we'll, we'll finish with that. And then, of course, uh, as we've said, we're very happy to answer questions. There's been a lot, um, which is great. We uh, are very encouraged by the continued interest in, in what we're doing. And, and uh, obviously, Greg will group them in themes. So hopefully, we'll address the themes that, uh, that you've all been asking first. And, and we can address other questions uh, afterwards if we run out of time. But with that, I'll hand over to Matt now and, uh, and ask him just to run us through the, uh, the financial uh, results. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. I'll talk to the financials now. Revenue was 6.3 million, down 8% on the 6.9 in the prior period. The business continued to face headwinds during the year as a result of COVID related impacts, which contributed to the project delays and the continued priority given by government authorities to managing COVID related health issues. Growth profit margin, gross profit margin was 57% for FY21, down from 60% in the prior year. This was as a result of higher freight costs in the period, partially offset by favorable pricing, particularly in Europe and slightly lower project application costs. Underlying EBIT, for FY21 was a loss of 7.9 million compared to a loss of 7.3 million in FY20. Lower sales volume flowing to gross margin was partially offset with lower operating expenses in the period. Whilst operating expenses were lower versus PCP, they remain relatively high as a result of continued expenditure on interim management and restructuring costs in China. Ongoing legal expenses as a result of the investigation higher auditing costs consistent with a board strategy to enable the company to lift the suspension of trading on the ASX and consultancy costs relating to reviews of the R&D program and the company's manufacturing supply chain strategy. Net profit after tax for the group was a loss of 3.9 million versus a loss of 25.5 million in FY20. Shareholders may remember that the prior corresponding period included a number of non-cash adjustments to receivables, inventory, plant property and equipment, and right of use assets. The FY21 result included non-cash adjustments primarily to lease liabilities as a result of the group signing a lease modification with its landlord in relation to the ZPET or uh, Foslock Environment Te Environmental Te Technologies Limited factory in China. The modification reduced the lease term, square footage and overall costs, and is part of the ongoing effort to right-size the business in China. The value of this adjustment was 
around 3.3 million. As reported in early January 2020, 2022, apologies, the company secured a settlement in relation to the outstanding receivable involve, involving a former customer and related party in China, BHZQ. The settlement concluded all arbitration and court cases for claims and counterclaims initiated by Foslock or BHZQ against one another. Now to cash. Cash payments for customers for the year were 8.7 million. Cash payments to supplier, suppliers and employees for the year was 15.5 million. Receipts from customers came primarily from the previously announced contract to remediate Crowling Supplus Lake in the city of Rotterdam in the, in the country of Netherlands. Cash outflows for the period included the previously announced consulting work on the manufacturing footprint and R&D activities. The decrease in cash outflows versus the prior corresponding period primarily related to lower employee payments and lower manufacturing related activity. FY21 also included higher direct and indirect tax payments as the company continued to resolve legacy tax issues identified from the investigations. It should be noted that the financial statements in FY21 were prepared on a going concern basis of accounting, which assumes the continuity of normal business activities and the realisation of assets and the settlement of liabilities in the ordinary course of business, supported by the group's strong cash position and net current asset position of 26 million. The group expected to utilise, the group does expect to utilise some of this of its available cash reserves to support its activities in the short term and settle amounts relating to external advisor costs arising from the ongoing litigation as a result of the board investigation. The group's current cash flow forecast indicated that the cash held by the group will be sufficient to support its operating activities and pay creditors as and when they fall due. And with that, I'll pass back to Lockie. Thank you, Lockie. Thanks, uh, Matt. And uh, as Matt has uh, illustrated, we weren't uh, we weren't thrilled, obviously, with the results of 2021. There was a lot of progress made in the business, in other areas, but but clearly we uh, we fell short of the of the results we were looking for through the year. And there were a number of key issues that affected the business, and Matt went through uh, a number of those as well. Um, clearly, COVID has affected the business. It does affect a business like us. Uh, quite a lot in terms of travel restrictions and lockdowns, um, funding priority changes from governments and uh, an increased freight costs. But it would be wrong to just say it's all about COVID. I know a number of shareholders have mentioned that, you know, there might be other things that we need to address and we certainly are. The business is rebuilding in a lot of areas and I'll talk you through some of that as we go. Other big impacts through 2021 uh, on the business, both positive and negative, were uh, around the resetting in China and the improved systems and governance that we uh, have put in place. Significant resource and time, as David has mentioned, uh, have gone into that, particularly Matt uh, and myself, uh, to addressing those legacy issues. And, and that continues to some extent that we, that we uh, simply have to address those to get this business on the right footing. We have uh, at the same time restructured and conducted a comprehensive business review of the China business. And there's been a major, uh, major restructuring of that business, which I'll talk you through in a minute, as well as the go to market strategy in China. And throughout all of that across the entire business, we've increased and lifted our governance standards uh, across the whole business to ensure we're uh, operating appropriately in all jurisdictions of the company, uh, which of course included, as you know, uh, significant renewal and change of the board of directors. While all of that has been happening, um, we've implemented a new growth strategy, which I'm really pleased with how that's rolling out. Um, we've restructured uh, the global commercial operations largely um, uh, in many, many of our areas. We've had significant reviews of R&D and the manufacturing and supply chain strategies which have been conducted. And we've also done a lot of work around our people, uh, performance and the culture of the business uh, on the way through. And I'll talk you through 
a number of those uh, those uh, those issues and those uh, opportunities, rather, I should say. Thanks, uh, Danny. Next slide. So, perhaps just to to elaborate a little bit more on the legacy issues, uh, David did touch on it in his opening remarks, and and so did Matt to some extent. You all know we've conducted a very thorough. Uh, independent investigation into, into all the matters. Uh, some of this is ongoing and will go on for some time. Um, we make no apologies for that. We have a firm commitment to uh, make sure we understand everything that happened in the business in the past and set this business on the right footing for the future. We cannot allow uh, what happened in the past to happen again, as I'm sure you all agree. So it will continue for some time, but we are... Um, we are committed to get this to get this done. I mentioned the independent review in China, uh, which was uh, undertaken. Uh, that was a comprehensive review, provided great insight into the Chinese market and how a business like us uh, can operate in a China in the Chinese market. And so, we've made some changes to the Chinese business, uh, particularly our go-to-market strategy, um, which I'll elaborate a little bit more on uh, in the coming slides. You're well aware we've put a, uh, a new risk framework in place um, with the appropriate corporate governance, delegation authority of authority and appropriate measures across all of these uh, areas, which has been uh, and is critical to operate this business uh, appropriately uh, in, in all areas of the business. We've made significant changes to senior management, as you, as you well know, um, in fact, uh, almost every area of the business, with the exception of Matt and myself, has changed since the beginning of 2021, uh, and we've brought in significant resources and skills to uh, to operate the business uh, on the platform that we're and, the, and under the strategy that we're uh, that we're working towards. There was a big focus on China debt collection. Um, you, you're aware of that, um, and you're aware of the success with BHZQ which was great in, in getting that receivable. We still have much work to do and we, uh, uh, we are pledging to you shareholders that we are, we are, we are working hard on the Jinwan Lake receivable as well. And that uh, continues to be a high focus for us. As part of the legacy issues, we continue to cooperate with the Australian Federal Police. Uh, that is an important component. Uh, of addressing the issues of, of the past. And we continue, as I say, to cooperate. And as, Dave, as David mentioned, uh, legal proceedings will be pursued against certain individuals. And uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about that in the past. Thank you. If I could just now turn to the business, and as you've seen, uh, we've talked before about uh, describe the business in the various geographies that we operate in and, and give a commentary on 2021, uh, what happened, and also uh, any summary and, and opportunities that we see coming through those particular areas. And starting in the top left with Canada, um, I've mentioned a few times how the interest for the product in Canada is fantastic and continues to grow with, with almost a new inquiry every, every few weeks coming through Canada. The issue we have is a regulatory issue in Canada um, for, I guess, uh, unknown reasons to some extent, the Canadian authorities uh, are wanting us to do a lot more regulatory work to gain that registration. We are committed to doing that and we're committed to working with them to, to achieve that registration. But I wanted to mention to, to all stakeholders and shareholders, that this will take some time to resolve. Uh, regulatory procedures and, and, and matters are notoriously slow. And so while it's frustrating, we, uh, we still believe it is worthwhile and important on the basis of what the Canadian market can offer the business that we pursue and continue with that, that registration work. So we'll update you with significant um, uh, milestones as they happen in that. Uh, and we have strong confidence about uh, a achieving that registration and be the Canadian market itself. In the US, uh, fair to say, this was a disappointing year. We did not meet our expectations in 2021. We had expectations of, of, of certain volumes from our, uh, from our distributor in the US uh, throughout 2021, they weren't met. 
Um, we have actually ceased uh, our agreement with CPRO, our distributor in the US, and have begun uh, some months ago, and part of my trip to the US was around the distribution expansion, which I'm pleased to report is really positive. And the, the commentary from the distribution that I spoke to, and I was in Florida and, uh, and the Midwest and various parts of the US, uh, were all very, very supportive. And in fact, uh, very keen to get behind uh, the product, which will help provide the footprint in the US that will lead undoubtedly to larger projects. And we have, um, I had some exciting meetings with the city of Orlando in Florida uh, and a number of uh, others that uh, were very encouraging about what the US can do. We will be enhancing our commercial structure in the US with additional resources. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But we've, uh, we've done a fairly in-depth analysis of the market throughout 2021 and, uh, and are encouraged with the opportunity if we put feet on the ground, the sales will come and the sales will come quicker. So we're, um, we're pursuing that strategy with, uh, with some vigor as we speak. In Europe, we had an excellent year, um, largely on the back of the Kerings de Place uh, treatment in the city of Rotterdam. Um, but not just that, there was many projects treated in Europe, uh, throughout Western Europe, throughout the Scandinavian countries, Denmark in particular, and we continue to see more and more opportunities appearing uh, in Europe. The Kerings de Place treatment, um, which I'll talk about on another slide in a minute, was exceptionally good uh, and has created a lot more awareness and opportunities in Europe. So we're very excited about that. We've appointed uh, the latter part of 2021 a commercial lead in Europe, Damien Whelan, uh, who's hit the ground running and is really, uh, really energetic and enthusiastic to, to what we need to do, as well as uh, Kate Waters coming back from maternity leave um, in our science role. And we also have a, an application lead uh, based in Germany, who um, Derek, who's come out of the US. So we've, we're very excited about the team and also the opportunities in Europe. We're seeing early projects already. Part of my trip was to visit um, uh, Glasgow, where we treated heritage lock, uh, not a large treatment, but nevertheless a repeat treatment. And uh, the commentary from the manager of the lake or the heritage lock, I should say, um, said that we would not be able to open this, this lock without having you guys treated, uh, having FOSLOC applied. So they wouldn't be able to open for the summer season. So it's very exciting about what we can do. Um, we have more projects coming through Europe, uh, which we'll detail at, at a later time. And we're also opening up some opportunities in Spain and France, which we haven't really done a lot in, in the past. So Europe is very exciting. Very exciting. In South America, uh, I described the business in Brazil as consistent. Um, our licensee there, Hydra Science, does a fantastic job of the current projects, but also has some new projects uh, um, emerging. A little bit early to be forecasting or budgeting for those new projects, but um, but nevertheless, they you know knowing his track record, they will eventuate. And uh, Brazil remains a very important component of our business. We're also seeing, uh, as you've heard me talk about before, uh, some other opportunities in South America, particularly Uruguay and Ecuador, uh, emerging, which is encouraging as the business um, spreads its uh, footprint across the South American continent. In China, I've mentioned a couple already around, uh, a couple of times already about the business being restructured and reset. That's a very important point for shareholders to note. Um, uh, at the time of, of our troubles of late 2020 or mid 2020, China was representing something like 85% of the business. So you can imagine when that um, hit the fan, so to speak, uh, we were uh, having to reset the business quite substantially to, to get the whole business back on track. And China was a, an important part to reset. We reviewed our um, and overhauled our manufacturing operations and our channels to market. So there's been a significant amount of work done in China. And I think Matt mentioned it to what we call right size the business. And um, while the big projects are fantastic, we need to have a business that can, can be sustainable through all project and volume sizes uh, as they come. So we are expanding also our portfolio in China. 
um, with some tweaking of the products to uh, to meet some opportunities that we're seeing in that market, and I, and I'll talk about that in a in a minute. Um, also in Australia and New Zealand, um, you know we completed works in Western Australia and Queensland. We have a project uh, um, ready to go in New Zealand at the city of Auckland, and uh, that's been delayed due to uh, due to COVID. Um, we're expecting to treat that in the next couple of months, but of course that's pending travel restrictions, which which as you know, uh, change quite quite regularly and. Um, uh, but we'll, we will do that. We have a lot of opportunities coming through in Australia and New Zealand. Some of them are quite large. They're early days in some cases, but they're nevertheless encouraging to know um, both markets have opportunities. We've resourced in New Zealand with, uh, with a distributor and a sales agent, um, some application support and some marketing support, uh, all, uh, all ready for what we see as uh, good opportunities in this part of the world. Okay, thank you. Just a, a couple of points on Kerings the Place. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity. That's the lake there. Underneath the windmill is, um, is the restaurant. I was there last week and uh, I can tell you that all stakeholders around the lake are very, very pleased with what's happened. The water is crystal clear. The treatment and the application could not have gone uh, any better. Um, over a thousand tonnes was treated, uh, was completed in under four weeks. Um, you know, the whole project was, was great from go to, from go to woe and, and the results, perhaps more importantly, are really spectacular. The city of Rotterdam, uh, led by a gentleman called Anna Moller, uh, could not be uh, more supportive and more uh, pleased with what we've done. So much so that we will be treating more um, waterways around that lake in this year. Uh, not unfortunately to the size of the Kerings of Plus itself, but nevertheless a clear indication that what we did has worked and, uh, and are very exciting. And the other exciting thing about a lake like this is the the other cities around Europe, not just in the Netherlands, but around Europe, a number of other cities have contacted the city of Rotterdam, or not, I'm sorry, a number of other lake management municipalities have contacted the city of Rotterdam already because it was a very public project. So that a lot of people know of it um, and have asked how can uh, Foslock help them. And so we're very, very uh, pleased with this whole treatment and the uh, and if you like, the marketing campaign around it has been uh, has been really well received as well. So, uh, oh, and just before we um, uh, before we leave that, sorry for Danny changing the slides. Um, uh, I would encourage you if you haven't already, have a look on social media or on our website to the videos. Um, they're extraordinarily uh, supportive from the city of Rotterdam and and really and really are encouraging for all of us in the business, but I'm sure for, for shareholders as well, to see what some customers uh, uh, see as the value of this product that, uh, that they're investing in. Thank you. So just uh, changing direction a little bit, um, I wanted to update you all on the, the growth strategy and the key drivers of that growth strategy. You all know that, that our position is, or our strategy is around expanding access across multiple geographies and products. Uh, that's what we're, uh, that's our broad strategy. And to deliver that, we've broken it up into sort of four sections that, that all have to work together and all have to be right to help us achieve that strategy. So these are the drivers, if you like, of the business. Uh, customer and commercial manufacturing, uh, supply chain research and development and, and people performance and culture. So it is my intention to sort of use these four pillars as, as, a, as a basis to update people, uh, update everyone as we go uh, on how we're performing in each of these areas. And, um, and I'll do a, a quick update now on, on each of them. Thanks, Danny. So for the commercial platform, um, as I mentioned, um, we are building the sales teams in Europe and the USA uh, particularly, and right now in the USA. Um, we've done quite a lot of market analysis about uh, what we need in each of these regions, and it's pretty clear with 
basically one person in the US and one in Europe and or, well, one commercial person in Europe um, that we're under, underdone from a resourcing. And the analysis clearly stated that if we, or clearly showed us that if we resource these areas, we will see sales increase and project increases. So that's what we're doing fundamentally. Um, and as I say, we're, we're gonna focus on a number of countries in Europe. So it's not a broad bust approach across all of Europe, but a number of countries. Um, you can probably guess the main ones from the, the way we've been talking about the Netherlands, Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries and the UK uh, first, and then we'll expand further as we as we grow. And then the US uh, targeting some specific regions around the Midwest and the Northeast, and of course the Florida region, which I'm sure you all know uh, has so much water and so many opportunities, uh, but we need to target it and we need to be uh, what I would call a little more targeted than we have been in the past to achieve uh, to achieve those sorts of results. I mentioned the travel restrictions easing. I don't think we should uh, underestimate the effect of these on both the sales team and on management. As David said, this was my first trip in two years uh, to actually meet some of the team, some of my team uh, or our team that, we, that we've put in place uh, since COVID started. So that was critical and it was great to see the guys and girls face to face. And, uh, and also, of course, customers face to face, because you get so much better understanding of what's happening when you can actually eyeball uh, people and talk uh, properly. So that was fantastic. So that was good for me, but also for the sales team, being able to actually travel around reasonably um, uninhibited is, uh, is very important. And we're seeing a lot more activity as a result of that travel. Um, it's still not easy there's still different regulations and rules for each country and you have to be aware of all of those but uh, it's certainly a lot better than it was and, and certainly starting to open up for us so I don't understate the importance of being able to travel and and hence the the indirect effects of if you like the COVID pandemic that it's had on the business I've talked about China and our sales model being reviewed and restructured so I think we've we've covered that and importantly, uh, and I'll talk about this in the R&D space, we, um, we have a number of products coming through that will fit the commercial uh, growth strategy and, and so will fit into the commercial plans uh, well. And, and obviously no R&D project will see the light of day that doesn't have a commercial uh, fit and hasn't been well and truly investigated and analysed from the commercial opportunities. So that's very important in our, in our commercial platforms. Uh, that, by the way, the photo is the team at Kering's the Plas. So the two guys on the left, you might re recognise Nigel. That's Derek, our applications guy, and the other guys were, were helping us with the applications. So just for your interest. Um, very exciting uh, news here around manufacturing and supply chain. Um, we can uh, uh, let everyone know that Casper in Wyoming in the US is the preferred location for our second manufacturing plant. You all know we've been talking about this for a while, but um, a site has been identified. It is adjacent to bentonite supplies. As you know, that is a key component. In fact, the majority component of our product. Uh, when you're choosing a manufacturing site, you can be close to supply or you can be close to customer. And we've chosen to be a very close to supply and pretty close to customer. So that's, uh, that's why we've gone there. Uh, the, the evaluation suggests that it'll be a low cost of production and certainly a low cost of supply. Um, very important to note that the state of Wyoming and actually the city of Casper are extraordinarily supportive of the business uh, and our opportunity there. So that we've been working with them now for many months and they're extraordinarily supportive of, uh, of what we're trying to achieve uh, and the indirect effects of, of getting uh, access to the water managers through Wyoming and other states that, uh, that provide the sales opportunities to us. So that's been very important. And of course, well, not of course, but it is important to note that Wyoming and Casper in particular are, are kind of well situated for the freight hubs, uh, north, south and east, west across the North American continent. So we are working still on design uh, to continue in Q2. We will uh, put
put in place a purchase option uh, around the site while the final assessments are being concluded. That will have some contingencies in it. We, um, we won't move to full commitment until we uh, are confident, uh, fully confident of all the future volumes planned in the business. And uh, at that point, we'll be seeking full commitment from the board and, and, uh, and a full uh, go ahead. But we will uh, continue to review that against the forecast for the business in the future years. Also in this area, we, um, we've improved uh, and committed to improve the China plant, uh, which has been uh, now ongoing. Well, we'll start in Q2 and Q3, very important for the Eastern hemisphere that that plant operates as, uh, as expected. And we've um, done some pretty major work in our SNOP or supply and operations planning uh, throughout Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year to ensure we, uh, we have the right inventory in the right spot uh, in the right amounts. So that's, uh, that's our manufacturing and supply update. So some exciting news there. Also exciting uh, has been the work in R&D, particularly in the last um, few months we appointed a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Doyle, a PhD um, a scientist who came to us on a contract uh, or on a contractual sort of basis, who's now agreed to be permanent part-time in the business, which is very exciting. So that's uh, good news. And we've identified four priority projects that are progressing at speed. And um, two of the projects are in the core, two are in the transformative part of the business. Uh, in the adjacent space, we, we haven't really uh, spent as much time on at this point. But in the core, I mentioned China is looking at a couple of different options in their portfolio. One, a lower cost product, uh, Foslog Echo we're talking about. It's under testing at the moment to suit a certain part of the market up there. And then there's also a Foslog Plus, which is actually almost the other end of the market, which is a high efficiency, higher efficiency product also under development. So there's a couple of things going on. The work they're doing there may have global uh, applications and that's obviously what we're, what we're hoping. Um, I mentioned also that we're expanding our distribution channels in both Europe and the US. That's quite significant and coming with that uh, is some work around the product itself and its ease of application um, across uh, multiple uh, types of waterways. So that's that's a really important piece of uh, work that's going on. As you know, um, it can be sometimes challenging to apply the current product, um, particularly on smaller uh, waterways. So this is a, an important piece of work that, that we're doing and developing. Equally, if not more exciting, is the work in the free flowing water uh, treatments. I'm well aware uh, and shareholders constantly remind me uh, that there are a number of competitive products coming through in this space. We are aware of, of them and we're aware and testing a lot of them. So we, uh, I don't profess to know all of them, but I certainly do know some of them, including some of them from a previous distributor in the US, which we've been questioned about. Um, but we are developing our own and we're very confident with, um, with a number of, of uh, technologies that we're reviewing. It wouldn't probably be pertinent to go through all of them, but uh, you've heard us talk about Zeep before, a zeolite lanthanum product. Um, we're expecting to do field trials in the middle of this year on that product. Uh, early indications uh, uh, that will be very successful, but there's work to do. Um, and we're also very excited about a contaminant binder um, that we're working with a US partner about um, high capacity phosphorus absorption uh, for treating particularly stormwater and ag runoff. And there's also further developments there around that technology in, uh, for larger lake applications. So there's some really exciting uh, product development work going on, which, um, which I'm really pleased to be able to report to you guys. Thank you. And finally, in the, in the drivers category, uh, people, performance and culture, I think that the key take out from this slide, guys, is that we've changed. The business has changed. Um, we've, brought, we've done a lot of change, a lot of management changes, a lot of structural changes, a lot of operational changes. And uh, a lot of it has been around the people, what we're trying to achieve. You can't deliver your strategy without the people and you can't 
expect your people to know what the strategy is and how to deliver it unless they operate under a structure and a and a guidance that 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 leads them through their everyday their job so to speak so we've changed you know aspirationally we were pretty much largely one-off big projects um uh, you know and that was that was the approach more recently and then the change if you like is a much more holistic approach to the way we treat the environment uh, our follow-up work um, the work with communities the natural ecologies that we're dealing with benefits to economies uh, and a much more as i say holistic approach to our customers and, and their business in the capability area we've we've moved from sort of having the business running on the capabilities of the people that were involved um, to more about what do our customers need and what do our customers want from us and structuring our business and capabilities around that. And so we've seen a significant lift in the diversity and skills of our people. And that's been, as I've said, around some of the management uh, we've put in, um, but that's to meet the customer needs. And, uh, and I think that's the right approach um, uh, for this business. And culturally, we've moved from an emphasis on sort of entrepreneurial growth with, with weak controls to a culture that's led by the board and the leaders of the business around uh, what we're calling PETS three Cs, uh, care, collaboration and courage. Um, but obviously, and, and you guys would know this, that the culture, if it's right in the business, will run the business the right way. So it's a very important component to, to how the business must operate. And that's uh, that's ongoing. I mean, all of these are ongoing. You don't do it once and stop. They're all ongoing. But it, I wanted to share with you some of that about how we're uh, setting the business up and our people in the business to, to deliver the results that, uh, that we all need. Thank you. Um, OK, so. Uh, Changing now a little bit, I get tacked again here. So uh, multiple questions on ASX relisting. Um, I, I would just say, as David said, we are very aware. We're very much like you guys frustrated that we haven't been trading for some time. Um, and we're doing all we can to get that uh, um, relisting happening as quick as we can. Um, the timing of the relisting, as you know, has been impacted uh, through 2020 and 21 audits and other matters. Some of those matters you're aware, but they're worth repeating the corporate governance requirements, uh, the board makeup and renewal, comprehensive investigations and independent investigations, the financial outlook, operational improvements, strategic initiatives are all uh, areas that we've been working on with the ASX under their guidance and direction to, uh, to meet the requirements to be relisted. And as David said, we've, we've done all we can do at this juncture. We've submitted a comprehensive um, submission to the ASX, uh, along with the audited accounts for both the full year 2021 and the half year uh, 2021. And we did the half, as you would remember, to ensure we had the best opportunity to relist uh, and, and give as much information as we can to shareholders, but also to the ASX so that they feel comfortable about where the business uh, is. So we've done that, we've submitted that, uh, and we now await uh, the, their review and their comments on the review. And of course, um, we'll update shareholders as soon as uh, we hear uh, anything uh, from the ASX, and, uh, and that's our, our commitment. Uh, just one final point, no need to go back to the slide. I'm sure it goes without saying, but I'll say it. The board and the management are committed to, uh, to, to getting this done. It is a, one of our highest priorities. Uh, so I hope you all understand that. We all understand your frustrations with it. So, um, so hopefully um, you, you'll at least understand where, we're, where, where we are at this point. Thank you. So just to finish um, uh, an outlook slide, if you like, um, broken into three, three sections. Uh, for 2022, first, the financial year 2022, which as you know, is a calendar year. Um, it's gonna be a challenging year for us. We're still rebuilding our sales pipeline after uh, some, some significant shocks to the business, uh, both from legacy issues, but of course COVID, and, uh, and other, you know, other challenges that have come at us in the last few years. 
However, we are continuing um, to grow and our diversification strategy is, um, is working and continues to, to look positive for the future. We are forecasting significant sales growth in both Europe and the US, and they will be the major drivers of our, of our year for 2022. Uh, obviously, Brazil, Australia New, uh, um, Australia, New Zealand, and China obviously contribute to the business significantly as well. However, the US and Europe are our, um, are our big growth engines for this year. Um, we will have some legacy issues and costs to deal with. Um, there will be resources required to, to manage some of these issues, and that's what I went through a few slides ago. Um, so that will, will be ongoing through 2022 as well. For us, the key areas of focus, the ASX relisting, of course, the commercial enhancement, I've talked about those. I didn't mention funding opportunities, but certainly a big area of focus for us will be to see whether we can uncover and get funding for our customers to help treat some of the projects that they have and we have on with them. Um, as you know, one of the limitations is funding to getting treatments done. So there is, and there is funding around. So that's that's a job that we're, that we're gonna focus on more this year. Canadian regulatory work, I've talked about the R&D, uh, launching new products in 2022, uh, very exciting, but, but obviously a lot of work has to happen. Uh, progressing the manufacturing expansion um, is, uh, is ongoing in 2022. Returning the business as much as we can to normalised operations. Uh, David mentioned it at the start. That is certainly a focus for us. Recognising that there still are issues to manage through and, and we have to manage those. But uh, that's, that's a focus for me. The China plant upgrades. And of course, a little bit to, uh, as I just said, we still will be managing litigation and legacy issues. We have to manage them appropriately and respond appropriately to, to the various investigations uh, that are ongoing. Uh, so that'll be a key area of focus. And I guess, you know, why am I confident? Why are we confident about the business in the future? Um, and we are. I mean, as David said, I'm actually very enthused after having been, you know, not able to travel for two years, to travel to Europe, to travel to... Uh, to the US was really, uh, really great and, um, and very, very encouraging. We do have a clear competitive advantage with our product. There's no doubt about that. I'm excited to, to learn, you know, how good that product is when you see it firsthand in the field and, uh, and there's nothing else that comes close to it. Yes, I'm aware there are competing products and people making claims they have done for some time. There's nothing that really comes close to us. And in, perhaps importantly, we are developing some really good technologies, which I will uh, say will, will outcompete a number of these things that we're seeing uh, coming through now. So that's very exciting. We do have the large and growing market um, and opportunity. You know, I, I should have mentioned in Europe, one of the things is the European Directory, uh, Directorate, which talks about managing nutrient pollution throughout waterways in Europe and those um, municipalities and owners of waterways, whoever's managing those waterways must comply. So many lakes will not comply that are too heavy in phosphorus contamination. There's opportunities like that everywhere and that's happening as we speak in Europe. And many, many people that I met are talking about those. So that opportunity is large. Along with uh, we, every second day, we hear something about environmental changes and global warming and methane gases coming from algae. And so there's all sorts of things that continue to drive this uh, macro market for us, which is large, uh, which is growing. And so that opportunity uh, remains really, really good. Uh, the diversification strategy, I'm, I'm happy that it's working. It's obviously got more to do. Significant um, and successful commentaries from people where we've treated gives me great confidence in the product. We do not fail. Uh, we have great results when we treat. And that when you treat a, a public lake like, like Kareem's the Place, for example, you get uh, great feedback and, and creates great opportunities. And, and as I say, we're seeing that already. And of course, the company remains well capitalized, which is important and uh, enabling us to, to do what we need to develop it and ultimately uh, set it on the, the, the sustainable growth, profitable growth path that we've talked about. So I think, Greg, uh, I'll leave it there. Um, 
Again, thank everyone for their attention. Happy to uh, happy to handle questions. I see we've we're approaching towards an hour, but let's um let's ha have some questions now, Greg. Please. Thanks, Lockie. Uh, yes, I've, uh, I've collated the questions that we got um, for, uh, as part of the application uh, registration process for the webinar. Now, I've got a couple of questions for Lockie, Matt, and David before we finish up. I know we have touched on a lot of these topics in the presentation because we had the benefit of seeing the questions beforehand and we were tweaking the presentation up until last night to try and cover off as many as, as we can in the body of the presentation. But anyway, I will we'll start with Lockie. Um, there's been some quite a few comments from shareholders about competing technologies to Foslox products. And can you comment on this in a bit more detail and what we're doing in response? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and obviously, one, we, we saw a number of people comment on it. Um, I would say that, as I mentioned through the presentation, Greg, we are aware of let's say the majority of the competing product, uh, products that, we, that, we, uh, that we're seeing in the market. And when I say competing, I use that word a little loosely because there's a lot of claims made, to be quite frank, that aren't, that aren't correct. And uh, we take many of these products, sample them, evaluate them and understand whether they are seriously uh, going to compete with us or they might be noise. Now, we're aware of most and we have um, I'd say limited concern about most. We're aware of certain, uh, let's say, uh, previous, uh, how do I put this, previous distributors that might even be uh, planning to launch products that look a lot like Foslock. We're obviously making sure nothing's been contravened in, in any of those kind of approaches. But we're also, and perhaps most importantly, developing our own technologies. And we have some great work going on here in Melbourne. Uh, also in Sydney, we're working with a university in Milwaukee, who I visited uh, when I was in the US, around developing these particularly flowing water P capture, but also flowing water N capture, um, which are very exciting. And I think while we're aware of these technologies, we've also uh, sorry, and, and our competing products, we've also got our own projects and development underway. And that's been kind of turbocharged in the last few months to really make sure that we're seen as the is the innovating company that brings this technology to the market. And we have some trials going on in the US right now with some of these projects. So um or products and technology. So I'm I'm confident we can we can manage that, Greg. Okay, and uh, heading into the Northern Hemisphere summer, how, how are forward orders and uh, you know, general interest looking? And in particular, can you comment a bit more on the new sales arrangements in the US now that CPRO is no longer our distributor? Yeah, sure. Uh, perhaps first part of the question. So, sorry, second part of the question first. Um, yeah, so, so CPRO and us, or CPRO's arrangement with us was uh, as an exclusive distributor of Oslock in the US. And that that arrangement has ceased as at the end of 2021. So we are now, if you like, um, uh, dealing with the distributors in the US directly. And the early indications, as I said in the presentation, are really, really strong. Uh, so much so that we're shipping product into their warehouses as we speak. And uh, I think the demand through the US will be, um, particularly the US, uh, strong through the summer to answer the second part of the question. And that's that's what we're seeing from our distributors. Uh, they're the ones driving this as we speak. Uh, applicators, uh, I have many calls with applicators as we speak, uh, sorry, during these last few months. And uh, and as I said, we're doing some trials down in Florida, which is, uh, which is really exciting. And that's with local government. And that's even more exciting because I understand uh, from my trip, exactly how much these guys are spending on uh, on remediation treatments that they do every year. That with a product like Foslock would uh, would significantly uh, enhance that position for them. So they're very keen to treat and want to treat as soon as we can get it organised. So yeah, I'm I'm excited about the northern uh, North America. I um obviously I'm frustrated, like I'm sure shareholders are, with Canada. Uh, but we will continue to work with that. The, the exciting thing about Canada is even without 
the, the registration that we need. Um, we're getting very good demand, uh, very exciting um, inquiry, and, and I believe when we get the registration uh, sorted, we'll have, we'll have a very significant component of our business in Canada. Thanks, Greg. Okay, thank you, Lockie. Now I have a question from Matt. Just unmute yourself there, Matt. Um, obviously, this is the number one topic that, we get, that I get asked is um, about relisting on the ASX. Now we have submitted audited accounts, the full year, the half year, a uh, full submission to the ASX is, is, you know, is with them. And, and in your mind, what issues still stand in the way of uh, relisting um, pet shares on the ASX? Thanks, Greg. As you said, we believe we have um, complied and done everything in response to um, the requirements for us to relist. We, and I guess the statement I'll say is we eagerly anticipate the response from the ASX. We are in constant contact, as David said. I think even Lockie said the same thing. And should uh, matters arise, we'll um, make it the highest priority. Um, at the moment, we're just um, waiting. We have submitted. We've uh, had acknowledgement from the ASX that they have received that submission. And uh, as I said, we, we are waiting their response. And um, once we get the response, we'll um, inform shareholders uh, as appropriate. Okay, thanks, Matt. And now a couple of final questions for David. Uh, can we get an update on the pursuit of the perpetrators of the fraud and mismanagement of the company in the past, that the company was subject to in the past, and the likelihood of success? Uh, yes, Greg, um, this has been one of our probably top five priorities um, out of the work that was done last year. Um, we really, with, 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 with my view, have a very uh, sober and commercial view of litigation. Um, you know, every lawsuit we launch is probably going to cost us a million dollars. Um, uh, probably on the low side. So I don't want to spray the world with litigation. Uh, I want to be very strategic about how we go down that path. Um, and that requires really three elements. Number one, uh, solid legal advice that we've got a good case. Uh, we want that backed up with QC advice. Uh, and then we want a good commercial view that we are going to recover, we have a high level of confidence of recovering some multiple of what the litigation is going to cost us. Uh, so we're trying to do this in a very unemotional way, which is not easy given some of the behaviours uh, we've uncovered in the past, uh, but we have to be pretty hard headed about it commercially. Where are we at the moment? Um, we have instructed our um, external solicitors to draft three letters of demand. Uh, one of them has already been served. Uh, the other two we expect to serve shortly. Uh, that is how we're going to kick off. Uh, that's not the end game, that's the beginning. Um, and we intend to pursue those uh, three uh, potential defendants uh to see whether it uh, is going to be necessary for us to proceed into litigation uh or whether uh, we can work out some commercial arrangement that remains to be seen won't be within our control uh, but about 10 days ago we served our first letter of demand uh, and more will follow Okay, and the final question, um, in the eyes of many shareholders, uh, previous uh, directors and management of Oslock appeared to be derelict in their duties. So a lot of shareholders haven't heard um, held back on their comments on this matter. Will any, be, will any action be taken against them? Uh, look, I, I don't want to um, uh, foretell what our strategy is, um, because I don't think that's in the company's interest. Um, but the uh, matters that will become public as we go from letters of demand, uh, if they're not satisfied, into litigation will be very public. Uh, and all I would say is watch this space. Uh, a lot's going on. Uh, it's complicated. We had to have all the facts. We had to be confident of the facts. 
Uh, we've got regulators who are interested also in some of this. Um, so we are committed uh, to bring to justice people who have caused the company loss. Uh, and we have now uh, begun that process. And when we can share more with shareholders, when it's in the company's interest to do so, uh, rest assured we will definitely do so. Okay, uh, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lockie. Thank you, David. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to all our shareholders who took the time to, uh, to log on to this webinar. Apologies for some technical issues to start, but uh, we got there in the end. And I hope you found it informative um, and helpful in terms of you know, your view of where, where your company is going in the future. Thank you very much for your attendance. And that concludes today's webinar.